and uh, he's very active in his uh, in his parish, which is uh, San Rafael's. Am I correct? San Rafael's under uh, Monsignor Dennis, who's here someplace. There he is. And um, after that, so now with that introduction, which is very short, Chris, <laughs> you may begin. Thank you. Welcome everyone, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to be here and I, I feel really honored to be asked to speak uh, at this conference and also looking at the other speakers who, who look so wonderful and I can't wait to hear them later. Um, the way I, I sort of organize my talk since there is a question answer period at the end is I kind of try to give a real broad overview of just the basic understanding uh, Catholicism has of the human person and holiness a little more specification of how the riches of um, what we call here interior monasticism came to be sort of shared, begun to be shared outside the religious order communities. And then finally, I'll, I'll give a little bit about myself and my own journey. And then any particular questions I feel can be um, answered then in the question answer period or during lunch or something. But I wanna begin by saying holiness is both our challenge and our destiny something all of us by our baptism, our Trinitarian baptism, God has granted us in Christ by the power of his spirit. At the same time, however, it's something that we have to consciously accept. It's something we have to live out and cooperate in order for it to take root within us and to transform us truly into what the Father created each and every one of us to be. Although we already hold by virtue of our Christian initiation that holiness, we're required to seek to manifest that holiness more and more in our individual lives, no matter what type of vocation we are in the church, whether cleric, uh, religious, monastic, or lay. That's the very call to every disciple of Christ. And from the Catholic, pers the Western Catholic perspective, you know, the human person is revealed to us in sacred scripture as this little microcosm of the entire creation. Each and every one of us is a divinely fashioned little mediator between heaven and earth formed out of the earth, but possessing the very breath, the spirit of Yahweh, created, the word tells us, in the divine image and likeness. So every human being, both personally as well as our entire species collectively, are called to be like God, to walk with him, to be in his presence, and as he told Abraham, to be blameless. So this divine summons and this call to holiness resounds throughout the entire whole of salvation history. We have it from the beginning of the Torah, where over and over the refrain, you must be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy, continues to ring out. We have the prophets who throughout their writings continue to promise Yahweh will restore his people their lost sanctity. The spirit will be returned to them if they just turn once again to him. In the Psalms and the other writings of Israel, we see that Yahweh's word will perfect us in holiness. It will make us and bring us into that holiness. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself renews that divine call, commanding us to be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's part of the constant apostolic teaching, each one of us called to be holy. And so as far as, as our grounding is, as, as Western Catholics, that universal call to holiness is a well-established fact of the divine revelation. And it's been consistently lived in the lives of so many saints, both canonized, and unacknowledged throughout the ages. Now, as a, as a Western Catholic, too, that the spirit, for me, the spirit-guided church continues to highlight this necessity of living in holiness uh, for as brothers and sisters of Christ and children of the Heavenly Father. And so I want to start a little bit now at the reflection, self, church's self-reflection that occurred at Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. And in that council, the council fathers there recommitted very explicitly the Catholic Church to the ever-present call of holiness. They devoted an entire chapter of one of the documents, Lumen Gentium, which is uh, the constitution on the church, to, in order to precisely point out, focus, and develop that topic for us. Uh, by the way, as I'm reading, I do have the handout, so all the footnotes and everything have everything if people need it. You, can follow along if you want or you can just kind of listen to me but there are several things that as the catholic church reaffirmed the call to holiness that we can see kind of um 
the beginnings of where the modern call and the modern life of the church and the search and the struggle for holiness, this interior monasticism for everyone comes from. Uh, just a few of the points briefly. The Catholic Church, reflect on itself as a spirit-filled and guided body of Christ, is already uniquely and indefectibly holy by God's virtue who created and sustains it. Right? Not because we're holy, because God is holy. And the church is his body, and it's infused with his spirit, therefore it's holy. And every member of the church, however, is personally called upon to manifest that holiness that already exists. Number two, Jesus Christ himself is the author and the consummator of all our holiness. And Jesus in his own life preached holiness of life to all people equally, and he bestows that spirit upon us so that we can hold on to and complete that holiness which we have already received and to which we have been called. The specific uh, statement the council makes at one point is this, thus it is, every, quote, thus it is everyone, evident to everyone that all the faithful of Christ of whatever rank or status are called to the fullness of the Christian life and the perfection of charity." End quote. In order to reach this Christian perfection, the council then goes on to tell us how the disciple is to make use of the divine grace that we live in, that we've received from Christ, to follow in his footsteps, to conform ourselves to his image, to seek to know and carry out the will of the Heavenly Father in all things, and to devote our entire being to glorifying God and in the service of our neighbor. And so once again, the church says, quote, the classes and duties of life are many, but holiness is one. That sanctity which is cultivated by all who are moved by the Spirit of God, who obey the voice of the Father and worship God the Father in spirit and truth. These people follow the poor Christ the humble and cross-bearing Christ, in order to be worthy of being sharers in his glory." End quote. Specifically, the council lays out that some of the means of possessing that holiness we have are very simple. Right? One is lovingly perform the duties of our state and vocation in life. Two, to joyfully and voluntarily begin to share in the burdens of others. Three, to receive all things in life with trust and faith in God. And so the disciple is to cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit in the frequent celebration of the sacred liturgy, most especially that of the Most Holy Eucharist, in daily prayer, in self-discipline and self-abnegation, in lively fraternal service, and in the constant and sustained practice of virtue. So we each have that call. It doesn't matter where we're called, if we're clergy, if we're religious, monastics, if we're laity, we're all called to holiness and to live that out. The way, the rhythm, so to speak, of it may has to be adapted to each particular vocation and call, but the reality, the unity behind it is all the same. Same Christ, same spirit, same call. Now, the church did highlight, however, the practice and observance of the three evangelical councils, faithful obedience, evangelical poverty and simplicity, and chastity for the sake of the kingdom, that those three, from the beginnings of Scripture, well into the time of the Old Testament as well, that those three practices are some of the most effective and efficacious means of fostering the life of holiness. Again, as I'll mention later, as adopted to each one of our vocations and lifestyles. And that's to manifest in a life of prayer, out of that obedience, of almsgiving, out of that fasting and simply, or excuse me, out of that um, um, poverty simplicity, and fasting and abstinence out of that heart of charity and chastity. And so the church exhorts all her children willingly to embrace this divine call calling upon every Catholic that this is their mandate. Quote, therefore, all the faithful in Christ are invited to strive for the holiness and perfection of their proper state. Indeed, they have an obligation to so strive. End quote. So how I'll kind of end this first part of the talk is, as far as the, the Roman Catholic Church has consistently taught and really holds out now, the all of us, every person, and we're focusing on the laity, I think, mostly today, are called to this holiness. 
The spiritual life, this progression in sanctity, is not now nor has it ever been supposed to have been solely directed to either the clergy or those in the consecrated state. But the call to holiness is grounded in the biblical revelation of Jesus Christ, who in his teaching made no distinctions whatsoever in terms of what people were called to, but proposed a single path of holiness equally to all. The Catholic Church, guided continuously through its history by the Spirit of God and the words of the Savior throughout the centuries, has at, over time integrated those different forms of religious and secular life that have arisen in history so that they more properly show the fullness and diversity in the unity we have in the Christian life. Thus, there are three states of life working together that make the church as one a mini microcosm of the whole of salvation history. And so in the way that Vatican II finally brought this together from all the centuries prior and such, the clergy are those who connect us to the past in faith. Do this in memory of me. They focus their ministry within the life of the church to preserve the apostolic teaching, to guarantee that fruitfulness and faithfulness to the teaching and the celebration of the sacraments and to help the, all the rest of the laity and the religious live their lives faithfully grounded in that constant and true tradition, scripture, and sacramental life of the church. So the clergy are one part of it. Two, the religious, the monastics, etc., connect us to the promise of our glorious future in Christ, for they live even now in hope. So we see just one example when Jesus speaks about the Pharisees and their misunderstanding of the resurrection. He says, at the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. So the religious are those living pointers to us of the coming kingdom whose values are not those of this, our fallen world. And that leads us to the laity. The laity, then, are the ones who connect us most to the mission of the church to be lived in the present time and life. It is to the laity who live in the world whose mission it is to bring Christ to the world in order to sanctify every part of it for the glory of God. And so from the church, the clergy send us forth. The religious are there as our models, as our inspiration, as those who pray for us. But for the laity, it really falls upon us for the sanctification of the world. And so the Catholic Church organizes itself in this one mission for the universal call to holiness. The fact is, however, in the concrete experience of the people of God, and um, despite the constant teaching of the Church, the divine call of universal holiness has not always been lived out in practice. As the church came to first evangelize, then later dominate European culture in the West, the divide over time between those who were entered consecrated life, the religious, and those who uh, were ordained to celebrate the liturgy and govern the church, the clergy, and the great majority of the faithful who lived their lives in the world at times grew wider and even solidified at points in history. Often, sadly, for part of our history, the life of holiness came to be understood almost exclusively in terms of those in the consecrated life or of those in the clergy, and that the laity would sometimes be treated in opposition to the church's own teaching, almost as a second-class citizen of whom a bare minimum was required, the minimum to be a faithful Catholic. Um, by way of one example, in the West, the first book to be written specifically for lay spirituality was the um, Introduction to the Devout Life by the Third Order Franciscan Francis de Sales, 1609. 1609. It's a long time. Every other, most works before that were written by religious or clergy for religious or clergy. And so there was a great distance at some point in the history of the church. As a result of this clericalization and segregation of the laity, the vast treasures of the Christian spiritual life came to be lived primarily in the lives of those belonging then in the West to the religious orders. Thus the monasteries, the religious houses, the friaries became for better or worse the custodians and bearers of, that, of our church's collected wisdom on the life of holiness. And it was into this situation that Christ raised up 
the most unlikely of people, the merchant son Francis Bernardone, to restore in actual practice that universal call to holiness. So I'm kind of moving now from the big call to where we see some of the historical beginnings of the return to this. Now, although it's a myth to say history actually repeats itself, history does, though, give us patterns that seem to follow the same uh, method over and over again. And so it isn't, it's interesting that in our time in many ways here in the West, the time in which St. Francis lived in the 13th century and 12th century bears many similarities to our own. Then as now, conflicts between Christianity and the religion of Islam. Then and now, there are serious class divisions as the desire for wealth dominates even Christian society. Then and now, especially in light of recent years, we know that the lives of many of the clergy and religious have become a source of scandal and public sinfulness of the church. Then and now, there's widespread violence and immorality, even within and among nations that claim to be in some sense Christian still. And the effect of all this in the modern church is this has led to a great indifference on the part of many of those who even still come to worship regularly, if not outright hostility and rejection of the church by many others of its once sons and daughters. And so in the same way, Francis himself through his own experiences, which I'm not going to get into tech, uh, in any detail here, but he himself became disillusioned with the conventional public religion of his time. And so he sought to find solace and refuge in Christ himself. What happened then, because of Francis's complete surrender and willingness to be an instrument of the Lord, was that Jesus personally called Francis to embrace holiness as a lay person and to embrace it concretely and authentically every day of his life. Uh, most of us know at least some stories of Francis. In the end, he performed that task and accomplished it so well that the Catholic Church from its highest levels, the papacy itself, has bestowed on him a title no other saint has ever been given, Alter Christus, another Christ. In his openness to the word, Francis let, him, let himself be led by the Holy Spirit to embrace the evangelical life as a means of living the holiness of the gospel. Now, just very briefly, the way that the church understood itself in the Middle Ages and today is that the church organized itself according to what it called the apostolic life. If you turn to the first book of Acts, the very first community after Pentecost and you have the first Christian community, we're told um, that the Christian community did this. Quote, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the communal life, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So the church had always understood itself as organized. This was both the, the whole church, the hierarchy, and the way that parishes were organized, but also within the religious orders themselves, is that you did four things. Doctrine, the teaching of the apostles. You lived that common morality and, and gospel living, the communal life. You celebrated the sacraments the breaking of the bread, and you pray. And if you're any Bible translation of the English that's correct, it will not say, and prayer, it says, and the prayers. That means what we have today as, you know, the ongoing liturgy of the hours, the divine office, that was already a Jewish thing that the church brought into itself. So it wasn't talking about personal prayer, that was assumed, but this was the life of the church. That's still true today. If you pick up the most modern Catholic catechism, in, uh, made under John Paul II, it's going to be divided into those four topics. What we believe, the teaching of the apostles, what we celebrate, the break of bread, the sacraments, the life of the church, the commandments, and the beatitudes, and prayer. So that still remains sort of the, the foundation. And to Francis's great, um, great understanding and discernment, he had no reason or desire to change that. He accepted it fully as already being um, a, a, a primary part of what his life would be. But he felt that Christ had called him to something different, the evangelical life. Now, what was the evangelical life? Well, the evangelical life that Francis sought to embrace was that he wanted to live the gospel life of Christ as it existed before Pentecost. In other words, 
how Christ and his own band walked and lived throughout the world. Not to be in, in a place like monastics, but to actually have the opposite vow, that you would wander as a mendicant everywhere throughout Europe. You would not have the people come to you, you would go out and be among the people. And you would do good works, you would literally work alongside them in jobs and such, things like that. And so Francis understood this, this new way, which is really an ancient way, of returning back to um, the life of the church and bringing it into this new thing. So this new manner of living was in fact really a, a return to the original Christian discipleship modeled in the life of Jesus and the disciples himself. And so Francis sought to fully embrace that call of holiness, literally following Jesus himself, the evangelical life, but never ever opposing or in any way denying, he practiced fully as well that quote apostolic life that the church was already grounded in. And so unlike later reformers in the history of the West, Francis never denied, denigrated, or rejected the church's life, which he also assumed was divinely given. Instead, he presupposed it as the essential activities necessary to fully live the gospel. His personal response to the call of Jesus to be holy simply meant for him to integrate and live all those things in a new way. And so was born the mendicant lifestyle to live the evangelical counsels and to quote, as the Franciscans say, to observe the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as a lay person in the midst of the world among common people according to the rule adapted to that reality. And in all this, he always sought the approval of the Pope and as such the Franciscans became the Holy Father's primary instruments for the reforms of the church. At that time would be the Fourth Lateran Council. And as the motto of the Brothers and Sisters of Penance, my particular organization proclaims, quote, in the world, but not of it, for Christ. So one of the things Francis did, which would have repercussions to this day for interiorized monasticism in the West, is unlike the monastic life, which Francis, in his understanding, sought to emulate the life of Christ in the, quote, desert, through ongoing rhythm of prayer, work, study, and solitude, that common brotherhood removed from the daily life of the world in order to pray for the world, he saw the new mendicant lifestyle, as he understood it, to be Christ, as he put it, in the marketplace, among the people, um, taking the traditional tools and teachings of the monastic life, obedience, fasting, <coughs> chastity, common prayer, all those things, and transform them in accord of those who are living in the world. So Francis literally created a whole new way of living the Christian life that alternated between a lay lifestyle lived in a religious manner. For example, just to give you an example, I am a lay person, right? I have, I, I have take vows, my vows are formal, I can't just leave them behind, I must petition Rome in order to be released from my vows but my vows are done as a as a lay person and um, one of the things in my particular group for example is we pray all seven hours of the day regardless we're lay people and many clergy today can't do that they don't have the time and effort it's difficult and so we fast we fast a lot and so these things are are monastic lifestyles things that came out of the religious orders and such of that time period, but Francis also understood that you're gonna to have to manipulate the rhythm of them as a lay person to be able to do these things, but the, but the quote, third orders aren't playing church, right? Sometimes people think, oh, third order, it's kind of, no, it's very difficult. It's a four year minimum profession time of postulancy, novitiate, formation, etc. And so it was, Francis was the one who brought this out that you would have lay people living according to what had been traditionally for many years in the West, the purview kind of of the religious and then to some extent the clergy. And so um, what Francis would do then is that his concrete works done publicly in this daily living and working among the people, that example of the Franciscans brought about literally a tidal wave of spiritual renewal. Entire towns who still are proud of this in Europe to this day, entire towns would approach him after some of his speaking tours and ask if they could join in some way. 
And it was specifically that that he realized that he needed to come up with something because as much as his rule was already a very different thing as a mendicant from the monastic life, many of these people who wanted to follow Christ, who were turned on fire by what they had seen in Francis, they couldn't leave, right? They had, either they didn't feel called to be wandering mendicants or they already had homes and families and duties that precluded them from taking up this life. And so Francis would have to do something else. And so these people who by circumstance could not leave their lives and commitments in the world to follow him, but wanted desperately to embrace his lifestyle of holiness, Francis did a second first. Right? He already did this weird changing of the whole religious life of the church in the West. Now he did something that had never occurred in the history of Christianity. He created an entirely new way of being a lay monastic, the third order. At that time, religious orders were organized as the first order, which consisted of consecrated men, whether the clergy or the laity, who lived in a community under the direction of a rule. The second order, which consisted of consecrated women who lived in a community under the direction of the rule, the poor clares in the case of the Franciscans. The closest there was was the oblates of the Benedictines, but the oblates were not considered full members of the group at least in that time period. I don't know how the modern oblates work theirs, but at that time they were really the helps, the assistance to the monks. Well, what Francis chose then is he created a third order. The church had to make up language to catch up with him. And this third order would be open to both sexes equally, males and females, whether they were married or single, and even to what today we would call diocesan priests and deacons. In the time it was called secular priests is what they were entitled. And they would continue to live in the world, but would be accepted as fully equal members of the overall Franciscan order. Francis thus obliterated, at least in many areas, any hard and fast divide that had grown up between religious and secular. And he brought sort of back to the from the clergy and from the religious all those riches um, that are the patrimony of the entire church. And so all of this just kind of brings me up to the present now. Uh, I'm, I stand before you as one of these oddities, right? A Roman Catholic platypus, a married man with three children. I work in the world. I work for the church, but I work in the world. Um, but I live according to a religious rule in the world. And as that, I have taken real vows that are really held by the church as formal vows and a profession of faith to sanctify it for Christ. In a sense, I think I, I live and all of us stand in a kind of a, quote, perfect storm of grace. You know, the Catholic Church, which is current crisis, necessitates a new breath of divine holiness among the laity. It really does. Among the clergy as well, but the laity, we need one as well. We have the current vicar of Christ in our tradition, Francis, who has literally just released last year, March uh, 19th of 2018, he released a document on living out the holiness that Vatican II spoke of in the modern world. Unfortunately, I guess it said nothing controversial, and so most people don't even know it exists, sadly. It's, and in my opinion, it's one of the most important documents he's released. But so the Pope is constantly urging people, what does holiness look like here and now? What do we do as Catholics? And then the riches of all the Catholic the background of all of our thousands of years of spirituality and mysticism that more and more are being made available to the laity through all kinds of various channels. You know, it's it to live the life I live as all of our vocations. It's both challenging at times, exhilarating, joyful at times, a struggle at times, because I live in two worlds at once. But in another sense, although that's true of my vocational call, that's really true of all of us anyway. As Christians, we all live in this tension. All of us live in an already, not yet. The kingdom is already present to some extent in our lives and in the resurrection power of Christ, his spirit flowing through us, the church. Yet at the same time, it's not here in its fullness or its, or its completion. We're not there yet. And so this, this um, tension is what we live in. Uh, you know, it's funny, I don't usually wear this, and probably at the lunch, after lunch, I'll probably just dress in, in normal clothes because I get hot. <laughs> <laughs> and we make our own, and so they're not, they're according to a pattern, but they're pretty.
pretty hot. But anyways, <laughs> we normally just wear our little towel cross to designate who we are, except in special functions, things like that. But when my middle daughter, who's now 10, when she was a, a preschooler, she was three, thank God it was a Catholic preschool and I, I knew the, the teachers, they knew me at church, they knew what I did. Because one day at Father's Day, they were all sharing about their parents. And what three-year-old even knows the word habit, right? And my daughter's pretty smart, but so she used the word, but the wrong one. This is what she said. My dad has the habit of wearing a brown dress. <laughs> so, like I said, luckily they knew who I was and it wasn't too much of a problem. But anyway, <clears throat> but so we all live that tension of a lay person, right? My wife, a fully, a fully devout practicing Catholic, she's not part of this. So, you know, all those things that you have to navigate um, as laity trying to live a, quote, monastic type existence are in some senses unique, you know, that, that those challenges and what come to that. Just a little background. I know my own journey to interior monasticism was in some ways somewhat like that of my father in faith, Francis himself. Um, I already had worked for the church professionally for many years. Um, and when you work for the church professionally, as you probably a lot of you know, you experience the pains and frustrations that only a person who works for the church knows, right? Yeah. And the sad part about that is I think it's even more frustrating because it's the church, right? And you want the church to not look like the world in petty disagreements and backbiting and politicking and everything else. Well, at a certain point, I just got frustrated, not with the faith in any way, but just, just how it was, it was just feeling weighed down. Um, and so I kind of went on a quest to really connect myself with Christ in, in my own, in, in, in Christianity, not to step outside the bounds. You know, I tried various spiritual exercises. I did Lexio Divina. Um, I did the constant repetition of the prayer of the heart, the Jesus prayer. I uh, went to Catholic charismatic renewal. I learned centering prayer and all those things are, are excellent tools and things. And they've all helped me in some way. I even um, began attending the Divine Liturgy at Holy Angels Ruthenian Byzantine Church on Galahad Road. Um, Father Mel was there originally when I started and then um, as the other pastors came in and I loved that. And that was really a change of pace for me that helped me fall in love again uh, with, the, with the liturgy and the Eastern Church's spirituality. And it was during this time period um, where I came across an article in our local diocesan newspaper that highlighted the various third orders that were active in San Diego. And although from my background training and such, I knew about third orders, I never really thought of them in today's modern world terms of their existence or even their, you know, what they were. To me, they were kind of an artifact from the past. I knew about them historically, but didn't really have any connection with them in the modern times. But so for several months, the next few months, and they put all their contact information in there, I'd contact some of the ones that appealed to me in some way. Um, I looked into the Third Order Carmelites. I looked into the Benedictine Oblates. I looked into Mother Teresa's Lay Missionaries of Charity. And in all of these, I, I found people who were really on fire to experience their faith more, to serve Christ more, to be filled with his spirit and really glorify the Lord. But for whatever reason, I didn't feel fully called to any of those. Um, in time, I thought I would settle on the Third Order Dominicans. Um, I love the intellectual aspect of the Dominican spirituality. Um, if you've ever come to my Bible studies, a few of you have, you know, my handouts are 20 to 30 pages long. People are like, am I taking a college course? But I just, part of that's, Part of that's holiness, part of that's just still struggling with perfectionism. So, um, but what I discovered is there were none at that time in San Diego. I would have to travel two hours to go to the, their meeting. And after a few months of trying it, I was just, that wasn't, I couldn't keep that up. And so at that point, a friend of mine, a close friend of mine kind of heard about my quest and he asked me, why don't I come check out the Franciscans with him because he had been, uh, going to their meetings for about three months at that point. And I remember my first reaction, I kind of sad now, but my first reaction was kind of prideful scorn, right? The little I remember to Francis from my history, I'm like, really? Not the guy who throws himself in snow and thorn bushes and makes snow people, you know? Like, eh, I don't think he's exactly for me. But 
God had brought me there. He brought this friend of mine into my life. And so I went. And so the grace of God did prevail on me. And I felt pierced through the heart by all the joy and peace I discovered in Francis's spirituality. And now I know that the Spirit had brought me to that place by a long, circuitous route, but it was to draw me more deeply into the Father's love. You know, Christ knew that in order for me to be more fully conformed to him, I had to be balanced, and I wasn't. My, my spirituality was all here, and I needed the Franciscan part to like bring it here so that God's love, the Spirit, could flow through me more completely so that I might glorify him more perfectly. And that's exactly what the Franciscan charism did for me. It's been 15 years now since I began that. And even today, that can, spirit continually reinvigorates me through that life of the rule and the spiritual riches he's revealed to me through the Franciscan charism. And that's where I'll kind of focus this last part. Today, the church, all the church, I believe, but speaking for the Church of the West, needs to really rediscover all those riches that so often we let lie dormant in the monasteries and religious orders. We need to let them out, let the Spirit breathe them forth again upon the laity more powerfully. I truly believe that in this third millennium, as we're beginning, that the laity are the future of the church in this next era of the church, that the Lord is in a sense bringing us back to our beginnings to return to that unadorned gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Yahweh brought Israel back to Babylon, from which he had first called Abraham in order to make it clear to them that they were starting again at square one to make a new start, so too, I think, the Western church is being placed in a time of exile to be purified, illuminated, and perfected for the Father. The laity in all of our traditions has always been represented the overwhelming majority of the people of God. And it is they who need to be equipped to be at the forefront of the church's message of evangelization and the sanctification of the world. We will always need the clergy to prepare and equip us to enter into that mission, to sanctify us by the word and sacraments. We'll always need the religious and the consecrated to pray for the world, to wage that war behind the scenes against the fallen principalities and powers, to protect us from their opposition so that we may do what our duty is. But it is to the laity who live in the world that the task of the kingdom has been most fully entrusted. And the, in my opinion, sadly, however, many if not most of them do not know how to perform this divine mandate if they're even aware of it. God has raised up, however, myriads of holy men and women throughout salvation history who are lights to help us on our way. Some of these saints are not only personal models of their life of Christian perfection, but their very charism in some instances has become a method that the church itself has, has uh, found to be an authentic way of living out the gospel. So specifically, I have a quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church explaining this. It says, In the communion of saints, many and varied spiritualities have developed throughout the history of the churches. The personal charism of some witnesses to God's love for man has been handed on like the spirit of Elijah to Elisha and John the Baptist, so that their followers may have a share in this spirit, end quote. And so the lives of these holy men and women have inspired countless of us other Christians to follow the narrow gate and constricted path of holiness, which leads to life. And some of them, their words and practices continue to teach us concretely how to embody the gospel of Christ and apply it into our own lives, so as to be truly conformed to the image of the Son, right? I mean, the Bible, the Lord tells us, the Word says, pray without ceasing, pray constantly. How do we do that? The, the, the saints show us, right? The monks, the religious orders, they show us the means by which concretely we put into practice the Word of God. Now, in my own life, um, for example, I do not simply have an affection for Francis, nor would it even be proper to say I just have a devotion towards him, which there's nothing wrong with and I encourage people to have. But by fully embracing his manner of life, his, putting his teachings about holiness into practice, seeking his guidance through constant intercession, and placing myself under his rule, as a Franciscan, I understand that Christ had given me a literal share in his Franciscan spirit, that I share in the personal charism of the Pavarello, 
so that he has truly become my father in faith, my elder, my steretz, right? my, the one we, we, who gives us the guidance. The church here in the West, whether it's the Western church or Eastern church here in the West, we find ourselves in a deadly struggle. I've worked for the church a long time now. 20 years ago, the issues lay in losing members of the flock to evangelical communities and the influence of the New Age and Asian religions. That's not the case anymore, although it still happens. The real enemy has finally been revealed to us, and its paganism returned under a certain form of godless secularism that has overcome the West, promoting and concerning itself only with pleasure, possessions, prestige, and power. Right? 20 years ago, people left to become other types of Christians. Today, they just leave, right? most of them. Now. Religion, therefore, has become simply a hobby for many. Others have left it entirely, lost in the grip of the fallen world. But even among those who come regularly, who continue to practice their faith, we often meet with a large set of indifference. People who are just concerned maybe with ritualism, they come because it's cultural or something, but they don't really let the Spirit take them in these celebrations of the body of Christ, of the Spirit of the Church. There's a lot of widespread ignorance, although we live in the modern West, the most educated place in human history. Um, and just even hostility and anger towards the church and religion. And so we really need, I believe, a reigniting of the Holy Spirit in our age, just as the church in Europe did in the 13th century, when that most unexpected and unlikely of men would rise as another Christ to set the world once on fire again for the master. The riches of the monasteries, must need to be poured forth upon all of us to help us once again connect intimately with our Lord. And I'll just give a few very brief things here because there's two other speakers and I know what they'll, they'll be covering. The first thing that religious life can do for the laity is to show us the absolute necessity of grounding everything, every aspect of our life, every moment of our day to Christ. Right? To make Christ the hub of the wheel from which everything we do revolves around daily. This grounding means we have to set up. You don't have to join an order like myself, but you need to have a rule of life. Right? We need to set up that rhythm that the monastics teach us of prayer, of silence, of sacramental celebration, of reflection. Right? We need to do that. We need to pray daily, at least in the morning and in the evening. Set times. You will never pray without ceasing if you can't pray at certain times without distraction. So there comes you know, that pattern that the monastic life has shown us. The monastic life also shows us the necessity to adhere to a disciplined life of penance and charitable service. Yes, it has to be adapted to our life in the world, but it has to be there. Without this basic structure, without that discipline structure, daily prayer, self-abnegation, without these things, whether laity, monastic, or clergy, our lives will become disintegrated, right? They'll just begin to fall and waver, and we'll find ourselves in problems and separated or far from our Lord. The, church, the Catholic Church teaches this. Spiritual progress tends towards ever more intimate union with Christ. This union is called mystical because it participates in the mystery of Christ through the sacraments, the holy mysteries. And in him, in the mystery of the Holy Trinity. God calls us all to this intimate union with him. The way of perfection passes by way of the cross. There is no holiness without renunciation and spiritual battle. Spiritual progress entails the ascesis and mortification that gradually lead to living in the peace and joy of the beatitude. And that's written by the Catechism for all of us. All of us. Like I said, our rhythm, the way we adapt that spiritual combat, our prayer life with the Lord, that's going to be different when we pray, who we pray with, but it's got to be there. The other thing, the third thing I would like to mention that the religious orders can reveal to us is, um, is the idea of community. The monastic life 
shows us the necessity and value of community in our own faith journey. We need the presence of others who believe in Christ as we do, who celebrate the liturgy and strive to live according to the commandments. It's because of them and their example that we can continue to proceed through their exhortation, the example of others, shared burdens, communal prayer and fellowship, and this constant encouragement. No single Christian can survive alone without union for others. Right? That is never, Jesus Christ is not our, just our personal Lord and Savior. He's the Savior of the world. And we are part of a body of Christ in which our life is lived. And especially in the modern time against this tidal wave we're truly facing of the world, the flesh, and the devil, you'll be swept away if you're not grounded in others. For the religious, it's their community. For you and I, it may be a group like I belong to as laity. For other laity, it may just be forming good Christian bonds of friendship. So your children grow up not just with your faith, but with these other families and interact with other children as parents or people of faith. You know, join these groups, do communal acts together, things like that. We need one another as we are at war in this evil age. And it is with others we are given the desire, the strength, and the courage to keep going out into the larger world to fulfill our divine vocation to sanctify creation, to proclaim the universal lordship of Christ by his resurrection from the dead, and announcing his one day return in glory for which we have been called to prepare all humanity so that all of creation will be brought in his coming into that great kingdom of God. I want to thank you all for letting me speak to you. Uh, let's just end really quickly in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much.